And now, it's time for another Dice Tower Review with Tom Vassell. Hey everybody, I'm Tom Vassell, and today we're taking a look at a party game, the brain-boggling game of kooky categories, uh, crossed words, or crosswords, or crossed, it's, you're going to say it wrong probably all the time. Doesn't really matter. This is a game in which you have essentially a Venn diagram, two things, things that are blue and things that are in the sky, and you're trying to find something that matches both categories. Well, not always. There's a workaround for that. Let me show you. The goal of this game is to get seven points. Uh, over the course of a round, the most points you can get is three. Each player is going to take a stack of nine discs of their color, as, as well as a pen of that color. And then each round of the game, you're going to see this board. You'll always pick a starts with card. So I put this here, starts with R in the first row, and then it shows me the colors that go in the other row and the colors for each column. So I draw one things here, things you plug in, and miscellaneous, Monsters and Villains. Here's another miscellaneous. Rhymes with read, or red, I guess. And then this things here, made of metal, and green proper nouns, boys' first names. We say go, and then everyone is going to start writing down answers. And when you have an answer, you'll put it down in a spot there, but it has to be something that matches both. So maybe for that middle one, I can write iron because an iron is made of metal, and an iron is something you plug in. Something that starts with R and is made of metal. Hmm, well, let me see. Oh, R and boys' first names, that's easy. I can write Ryan. Seems like a pretty obvious choice there. Monsters and villains made of metal. Oh yeah, that's easy. Cybermen, you know, because those guys are villains for sure. So I can write that there. Now, you can even write clever answers. Monsters, villains, and boys' first names. I could write, for example, here, Frankenstein. Very sloppy writer here. Oh, I'm sorry, I write Dr. Frankenstein, just in case you're confused, and put it here. Why does that work? Because Frankenstein is a monster and a villain, and Frank is a boy's first name. And that's kind of the point of the whole game. You're allowed to do stuff like that. For example, Here's some in the, in the rule book. Uh, places in the USA, cartoon character. Yosemite Sam is a cartoon character, and Yosemite is a place in the USA. The entire answer needs to fit one category, but part of the answer can meet another one. Or like boys' first names and colors, Fred. Fred's the boy's first name, and part of it, red, is also a color. And that's kind of how the game is. Now, you're allowed to put down more than one disc in an area if you want to. And once one person has put down all their discs, you count one crosswords, two crosswords, three crosswords, four crosswords, five crosswords, and then we go to scoring. When scoring happens, you know, there's going to be multiple discs in each one. You'll pull out the discs and you will compare them. You'll get rid of any answers that are just wrong or don't fit the categories. And here I wrote Ryan, that seems obvious, but if someone else writes the same answer as you, both your discs are eliminated. However, if you have one or more discs remaining, then one of those discs is set aside in a scoring pile. Even if I got three right answers, I only get to put one disc in the scoring pile. And so I might, you know, the only reason to do that is kind of to make sure that one of your discs gets done there in that point. Once we do that, we see who has the most discs in the scoring pile. That person gets three points, then two, then one. And in case of a tie, everyone gets all the points for that tie. Then the round's over, everyone erases their discs, and you get ready for the next round by drawing a new set of cards. First person to seven points wins, and then whoever, well, first person to seven points, that ends the game, and whoever has the most points is the winner. Party games don't need to have the most flashy of components, and you're definitely not getting them here. This plastic tray here is actually an insert that goes in the box where you'll store the discs in between games. Uh, the markers are fine. I, they haven't gone out on me yet, so they, they're better markers than in most of these erasable games. And the discs are fine, but I will say that throwing the discs in there, as happens, will often cause stuff to be erased from the discs. So, you know, I wrote Cybermen, and you can see it's not hard to, to cover these up. I don't know how to fix that part, but I also will say that erasing all nine discs, which there's no eraser included in the box, you use like a paper towel or something, erasing these every round gets old really fast. 
The fonts and everything for the game are fine. Um, you know, they're easy enough to read and you just go over them at the beginning. Uh, other than that, you know, like I said, the components are fine. A small problem I have with the game was also the rule book. The rule book is written in a jokesy way, which isn't very helpful, I think. Um, I'd rather you just tell me how to play. Like, for example, how do I play the game is the first point here. Then it's, oh, uh, it seems all I've done is set up the game. How do I play? And then they, they answer, oh, right. Well, that part is not quite as easy, but pretty close. I don't, need, I don't have time for that sort of thing. That makes reading rules irritating, I find. Now, sometimes joking works. Uh, Vlada Kovato has done it in his games before, and for some reason he can pull it off. But most people can't. And then there's like a wall of text here on how to keep score, and it's not that complex, but I had to read it a couple times going, how does that work? You know, it's, it just seems a little odd. And they're like, well, you know, have fun. Okay, fine, I get it, it's a party game, but just tell me how to play. This game, Crosswords, is a game that I think there's going to be groups of people who find this game to be amazing. And in fact, I was looking at the, the people who play tested this game here, and they're some of the smartest people I know in the board game industry. But I am not one of the smartest people in the board gaming industry, as evidenced by many of the comments made on my videos. And so while there's that clever thing, like when I explain the game, people are like, woo, Fred and red. That's really cool. But in a timed atmosphere, it's pretty difficult for most people to come up with those clever answers, which is what you need to do to fill some of the categories. Some categories just don't work otherwise. You need to think of that Yosemite Sam thing to work. And while if you have those people who are like, ooh, and they can do those mental gymnastics in their head, those people are going to really enjoy the game. But it's going to be extremely frustrating for others. Not to mention, as with many party games, it's easy to game the system. I don't know any more answers, so I'm just going to write wrong answers and throw them out there to prevent you from getting more discs. There's no negative penalty for throwing out bad answers, uh, so why not just write anything? What does it matter? Just to get stuff that's out there. And I found that it kind of then really tilts towards a very specific group of people. That's not necessarily a bad thing. There are party games that will appeal to a smaller subset of people. I prefer games that you know, appeal to everybody. Uh, you know, for example, you can go to the lowest denominator, apples to apples, or I don't know, throw a card in, you could still win in apples to apples. That's not gonna happen here. You can't just throw an answer in and, oh, it works. You have to actually do it, but you're doing that, thinking of these really cool clues in a time situation because there's probably someone at the table who's gonna finish fast, and I played a game of this where one person just finished fast every single turn, and that's frustrating for everybody else. Their brain just worked faster than everybody else's in this particular situation, and everyone else just wasn't able to get it done. You get a bunch of people who are on the same level intellectually, or at least this kind of intellectually, right? Being able to figure out clever, punny things, and oh, look, you know, um, you know, you might have said, oh, Tom, you did Frankenstein there. Yeah, I thought about it before I recorded the review, and I have. But every game of this I played, every time we do them, there's like one or two of those answers that are out there. And most of them are just kind of obvious. You plug it in, it starts with an R, refrigerator. Uh, it's a toy in a boy's name, and you're like, oh, I can't think of that one. I'll just go to a different one. And I, I found it just didn't work for me or any of the groups I played it in. Now, for some people, it probably will. So I'm not saying that it's a bad game at all. It's just that as a reviewer, I have to tell you what I think of it, and I just was like, eh. It also doesn't look that exciting, right? You see this on the shelf, you're like, ah, is that good? And there's a lot of games that have this Venn diagram thing. And when I heard, when I read the rules, and maybe even when I explained it, you, you probably might have said, that sounds really cool, because I did too. I was like, oh, that's really neat. The, that, that major, the major hook of this game is the fact that the clues can be weird like that. It's just that because there's a timed element in the game, that really neat aspect doesn't come into play as much as I would want it to. So, yeah, unfortunately not for me, but I can see a bunch of groups enjoying crossed words. Dice Tower Judgment, too clever for me.